Greetings, everyone. I hope you're enjoying the conference so far. Uh, my name is Stephen Rahm. I'm the Chief of the Office of Clinical Direction and Co-Chair for the Center for Emergency Health Sciences. We're located just northeast of San Antonio, um, the big old state of Texas. In this session, we're going to talk about pre-hospital transfusion, bringing blood to the streets. Yes, actually a reality of, of actually administering whole blood at the point of injury for better patient outcomes. We're gonna start by talking about blood in general, its composition, its functions, the ABO classification system, how they come up with the eight different types of blood. And then we're gonna talk about the reason for pre-hospital transfusion or the rationale. Conventional wisdom would tell us that if a patient's bleeding, the earlier that we transfuse them with blood, then the outcomes will be better. And when you look at the science and the research and the evidence dating all the way back to the military, they've been doing this for eons. It actually turns out it's true. The earlier you transfuse somebody, the better the outcomes are going to be. So we're gonna look at some science. And then we're gonna talk about low titer O positive whole blood, which is the unit that we are using in our region. Obviously, as you know, type O negative is universal donor, type O positive is not. So low titer O positive whole blood is simply O positive with low titers of antibody. So what does that translate to? That means it's as safe to give as O negative to patients of all different blood types. And because O positive is a more common blood type than O negative, kind of allowed us to cast a wider net and get a bigger donor pool so we can keep the blood moving in the field and in the hospital setting. We'll talk about the indications or the physiologic criteria that would kind of flag that patient to let us know we should probably start a transfusion in the field. We'll also talk about the contraindications or when we should not be transfusing patients. Although not common, transfusion reactions can occur, but we need to discuss those. We'll talk about their general signs and symptoms, a couple of specific um, transfusion reactions and their mitigation strategies or pre-hospital emergency care. And then finally, we'll talk about the logistics what it takes to get a whole blood program off the ground in your region or your locale. I'll share with you our systems experience. We've been online with whole blood since 2019 in my, re, in my EMS system, but 2018 in our region. I'll share with you our successes, some things that we've learned along the way, and basically the processes that we went through to make this uh, more than just a concept, to make it actually a reality. If one were to lose a lot of plasma, and for example, with burns, they're not really losing red blood cells, then their, their hematocrit would correspondingly go high because now the ratio of plasma to red blood cells has gone up. Red blood cells are produced in your red bone marrow, and that's the component that combines with hemoglobin to carry oxygen. So those are your RBCs. White blood cells, leukocytes, and, and I should mention that the blood that we carry is a non-leukocyte reduced whole blood. So they don't remove any of the formed components out of the blood. So everything that a person would normally get in their own inherent blood is what we're able to transfuse into them. So obviously you have your, your mechanism for destroying microorganisms, the antibodies you produce in response to antigens. And on some patients, especially those that may rarely experience some kind of transfusion reaction, that would be the component of the blood that would cause that would be the, the white blood finding or detecting these mutated cells and snuffs them out really, really quickly. When one of those mutated cells goes unchecked and it starts to deform, then that's where you develop malignancies and things like that. So as you can imagine, when a person becomes immunocompromised, they lose a lot of that ability and therefore are at higher risk for not just infections, but malignancies, cancers as well. So a critical component of uh, or a critical function of our blood, then it has a regulatory function in terms of, uh, of trans uh, transporting hormones, be it insulin or glucagon or um, ACTH or thyroid, st thyroid stimulating hormone, whatever hormones your body produces, your blood transports them. Also helps maintain salt and water balance, key enzymes, and of course, body temperature. Now here's the clincher. None of this is provided to our patient when we give crystalloid, you get none of this. So the, the inherent functions of the blood, everything that it does for us, when we start dumping in a lot of crystalloid, we're essentially competing with the body's ability to preserve and maintain its own, its own homeostasis, if you will. So there's, I'm sure a lot of folks out there right now that are listening to this are thinking, man, you know, go back 15, 20, 25 years ago, 
And we were just barraging people with crystalloids, normal saline lactated ringers. I mean, it was two large bore IVs running liter upon liter upon liter to the point where you were essentially turning their blood into Kool-Aid. So what were we doing with these folks? Well, basically we were hema diluting them. We were washing out clotting factors, which I'm thinking if you're bleeding internally, you kind of need those clotting factors. And we all focused on one key parameter and that was blood pressure, right? We wanted to get somebody's blood pressure up because that made us feel better. It wasn't a matter of what made the patient feel better. It's a matter of, well, I want a blood pressure of 120 over 80. And in a textbook that looks great, in a non-bleeding patient, that looks great. In a bleeding patient, all you're doing is making that patient bleed more by raising their blood pressure. So it's important to remember that in the world of crystalloid, if your patient has lost water, be it from burns or dehydration or whatever the case might be, then that would be an appropriate replacement fluid. However, if they've lost blood, we need to give them really what they've actually lost. So that's the whole impetus behind this presentation today. As far as your ABO classification, again, this is just a review for everybody, just to help us kind of, you know, reset these concepts in our mind. Your blood type is determined by the presence or absence of two antigens, either an A or a B antigen. So a patient with type A blood has the type A antigen or surface antigen. A person with type B blood has the B surface antigen. A person with type AB blood has both an A and a B surface antigen. And of course, a person with type O blood has neither of those antigens, which is why O negative has always been considered to be the universal donor because that blood type does not, um, does not have any, either the anti-A or the anti-B antigen. And then of course you have your RH factor. The RH factor was, uh, was actually discovered when they studied rhesus monkeys and it's R-H-E-S-U-S, -E rhesus monkeys. And it's a protein that's either present or absent on, uh, on, the, on the surface of the blood cell, which then creates eight different blood types, A positive, A negative, B positive, B negative, AB positive, AB negative, which is a universal recipient. They can take blood from anybody, O positive, and then O negative. That forms your, your eight different blood types. So where, where are we at in terms of how common we are? Well, if you know what your blood type is, then you can see and look up here that if you're AB negative, then you have the rarest blood type. Less or a little more than a half a percent of the population has AB negative. What about the universal donor? Universal donor, only about 6.6% .6 of the population. I'm O negative. I'm about 6.6% .6 of the population, which would explain why the blood bank is calling me probably seven or eight times a week, a week. I try to donate blood whenever I can. And uh, because I realize that my blood saves lives, uh, my family members have been recipients of blood before, so I know how critical that is. So my little pitch here is regardless of your blood type, you should get out there and donate blood, especially with this pandemic. I know uh, earlier on this year, um, we're running really, really low on all different types of blood, but specifically O negative because people just weren't getting out a lot. And those that were, were still getting injured. So people are still bleeding. So O negative, about six point. 6% of the population. It's not the blood type we're talking today. We're talking about positive, not the positive. So what did that enable us to do? It allowed us to cast a wider net. You cast a wider net, you get a larger donor pool. Therefore, we have more people who can come in and give blood so we can provide blood, not just in the hospital, but in the pre-hospital setting. Now, not everybody with O positive can donate and become part of a low titer O positive whole blood. And that's what we're going to talk about here in just a little bit. So why transfuse somebody in the field? Well, we know that trauma is still a leading cause of death in people under the age of 44. Hemorrhage, uh, hemorrhagic shock, about 60,000 deaths in the U.S. alone and about 1.9 million of that. So that much more critical that we get this precious commodity to our patients. And there's literature out there. I mean, there's tons and tons of supporting literature and you can see, and I'll include my email at the end of this presentation. If you want any of these studies that have come out, please just let me know. I'll be more than happy to email them to you. And I've got a whole folder and this is just, I just took some screenshots and put these up here just to show you that Yes, we have proven, we've shown that, that blood transfusion in the pre-hospital setting is directly linked to patient outcomes 
what you're looking at right now, this was a uh, this is a case report that came out of the city of San Antonio on a, a pregnant patient, severe maternal hemorrhage. Now, in ordinary circumstances, it was all universally agreed this woman would have died in the pre-hospital setting. No ifs, ands, or buts, she would have died. But because they were able to, to transfuse her in the field, this woman not only survived hospital discharge, she walked out of the hospital neurologically the best possible outcome from cardiac arrest or the best possible outcome for anything. It's more Christmases, it's more Easter's, it's more Thanksgiving's, it's more birthday parties, it's more grandbabies. So that's what we're in this for. We're in it for the, for the end game, the end result. So tons and tons of literature out there. This was a, a, a scientific poster that our region presented at, a, uh, at our regional RAC meeting, <clears throat> excuse me, um, in terms of, uh, of basically the conclusion of the obvious. You give blood earlier, then you get better outcomes on patients. And as you can see, it's catching on. Peter and Tebby out in Florida put this on Twitter. They, uh, they're giving whole blood down there in Florida, Onslow County, North Carolina, who I believe just won an award at EMS World for their whole blood program is starting to offer this in the field as well. There are others. There are more and more people that are coming on board with this. When a lot of folks think of firing up a pre-hospital transfusion program, a lot of times they're immediately thinking, oh my God, that we extremely expensive, very laborious, and essentially just impossible to do. Folks, it's not. Yes, there is an upfront cost, I'm not gonna lie to you. And it does take some legwork, it does take some communication and collaboration of a lot of really people, a lot of, a lot of, really, a lot of really good people, shall I say. But it is very, very doable, it's very doable. So what is low titer O positive whole blood? Well, essentially it's O positive blood with low levels of anti-A and anti-B antibodies. Now I said earlier that even though about 38% of the population is O positive, that doesn't mean everybody who is O positive is low titer O positive. So males, for example, inherently have lower titers of these antibodies than females. So in our whole blood consortium, um, which is called Brothers in Arms, and I'll, I'll elaborate on that here in just a second, uh, males are the only ones who are able to donate to that particular donor pool. And obviously they're not gonna turn down anybody's blood, but donors below a certain cutoff level of antibodies, I believe it's one in 256 are considered to be low titer. And the definition of low titer may vary from, from organization to organization or blood bank to blood bank, but essentially we're still taking a larger pool of donors. We're able to to substrate that larger pool of donors to low titer donors. And we have a, a very hefty group of folks that come in routinely and religiously and give blood so that we can keep it going in the field, keep it rotating into our hospitals. Very, very low risk of transfusion reaction, as I said, about one in 80,000. So what does that mean? We can, tr we can safely transfuse low titer O positive whole blood in patients with all blood types. We don't have to cross match them. We don't have to, obviously the blood is screened. It's typed and screened for obviously any type of bloodborne pathogens, but when that patient needs it the most, we can give it to them. So I'm gonna take this uh, the next couple of minutes, just talk to you a little bit about blood, uh, blood storage versus transport of blood, because there, there are some different um, definitions um, that are relevant to those of you that may be interested in, in getting something like this running in your, your region or your agencies. So blood is stored at a regional blood bank and tissue center. And, and when it's stored, it must be kept within a temperature range of one to six degrees Celsius. When we get the blood in the pre-hospital setting by regulatory definition, it's in a state of transport. Now, blood gets transported every day. It gets transported by FedEx. It gets transported by UPS, the postal service. So when it's in a state of transport by an EMS agency, for example, then the temperature range can be a little bit more. Our personal experiences, I like to keep the same temperature range that the stored blood is kept at just as a, a safety, a buffer. I don't want the blood to get too warm. However, we can let the blood get up to 10 degrees centigrade, which is about 50 degrees Fahrenheit. The shelf life of a single unit of whole blood with the CPDA preservative is 35 days. So when we get the blood to us, it does not stay with us for 35 days. If we don't use it within a certain time frame, then it gets routed back to a rotation center. And we'll talk about the concept of rotation sites and rotation centers here in just a few minutes. 
Uh, I took these uh, these pictures to put in this presentation. This this is the setup that we carry within our agency. There are other setups out there like this. I'm not saying you have to use this one. I'm not saying it's the best one. I'm saying that this works for our agency. So over here on the left, you see the little unit of whole blood, and then you see this little uh, this little um, com um, this little component right here is called a temp stick, and it connects to your Wi-Fi and you monitor the temperature of the blood on an app on your phone. And you can set up anybody in your agency to be able to monitor that. So if the temperature gets below or above whatever temperature thresholds you set it at, then it will send a text message to everybody on that text chain to let them know that um, something's wrong with the blood. As a redundancy, we throw in an analog thermometer within these, they're called tick panels. It's a thermo insulation container panel. So we have the Tim stick, we have the unit of blood, we have an analog thermometer, and then we wrap the unit of blood in a surgical towel. That way the blood doesn't come in direct contact with the tick panels. It could cause local freezing. And that's the last thing we want to do is damage the blood. I'm going to geek out here for just a second. These temp sticks are really cool. I bought three of them and I have them positioned strategically around my house just so I can monitor my temperature in my house, see how well my AC is working and how well my heater is working. So I'm sure you're laughing at me, but hey, it's a really, really, cool little product and it it doesn't it doesn't give up i mean we've had the the same temp stick since our inception in july of last year on the same set of batteries and it's still at 100 percent this is the the carrier that the tick panel goes in and our agency we carry one unit of whole blood and we service 216 square miles of western comal county in south central texas our battalion chief carries the blood in his vehicle because he's rapidly deployable to any one of our four stations. So we figured that would that would be a good central point. On occasion, I, uh, I may respond in a quick response vehicle. And if I'm able or available that day, then I'll carry the blood with me. But the whole point is that it must be rapidly deployable. We have the ability to keep this on our battalion chief's vehicle because we have a basically a mobile hotspot that we connect, uh, connect that temp stick to. So we're continuously getting readings and if the blood gets a little too warm or a little too cool, um, more likely to happen in the, the, you know, the dog day heat of summer or the extreme temperatures of really, really bad winters down here. Our winters are brutal. They get way down in the, the upper 40s. I'm telling you, it's terrible. So I really like to go places where it gets cold every once in a while. So this, uh, this is a, a little example of what we see with the temp stick. So on the left side, and this is, this is accessible through a, a web page or a web um, program or through an app on the phone. And it just shows the temperature thresholds and how they kind of fluctuate throughout the day. It also monitors humidity, it monitors dew point. And then if that temperature gets above or below whatever parameter we set it at, then you can see that we get a, a text message that instantly alerts us that we should probably go check the blood. As far as blood and fluid warming devices, there are several of them that are out there. There's the Q and Flow. Another one, the one that we just happened to use is called the quantum life warmer. I'm not pitching these. I'm just telling you that, hey, pick one that works for you. And I think that they all have merit to them. We just happen to uh, to use the uh, the quantum. City of San Antonio uses a Q and flow. They have good experiences with them as well. All right. So that's kind of the introductory stuff, right? So let's let's first talk about the most important part of this, this conversation. And that is we need to stop massive hemorrhage. It is totally a galactic waste of time to start dumping things in uh, if we've not stopped what's coming out. Many of you may be familiar with this March assessment. This is pounded, and I do mean pounded, into the brains of our military um, corpsmen and combat medics, and we're starting to pound it in the brains of our people in the civilian sector because it is a rapid way of assessing a patient and finding what's gonna kill them and fixing it and then moving on. And as you can see, right up at the top of the list is massive hemorrhage. For those of you that remember, you know, you're studying for your national certification exam or your state exam, and you're always told, if you see airway, always pick airway. Airway's always the best answer. Well, that's not necessarily true anymore because I look at massive hemorrhage as not just being a circulation problem. I look at it as being an oxygenation problem, right? If you're losing blood, you're losing oxygen, and you are going to bleed to death, from exam for example, from, oh, I don't know, a severed femoral artery. In a healthy adult male or female, you have about two to three three minutes, two to three minutes, and you're going to bleed to death. Unfortunately, oftentimes we get there long after that two to three minutes, hence the stop the bleed program, right? Put the, put the 
first first responder out there, the civilian, tourniquets, proliferate tourniquets around the world, I say, because this is true. Where there's a tourniquet, there should be an AED and vice versa. So we have to stop massive hemorrhage. Once I've made sure you're not squirting blood, and I'm not just going to look at you, I'm going to put my hands on every square inch of your body and make sure there's nothing coming out. Only then have I guaranteed that you're not squirting blood. Then am I going to fix an airway problem? Does that mean that I have to intubate you? Absolutely not. It may mean I put a couple of nasal airways in you and put you on your side. So it just means I need to fix an immediate airway problem. Then I get to the R, the respirations. It's at that point that I'm thinking of putting a needle in your chest if I suspect the tension pneumothorax. It's at that point that I'm determining whether or not your overall breathing adequacy is good because you can have an intact airway and totally be breathing like not good at all. So at that point, I should probably fix that. And then circulation, really all we care about immediately is do you have central and peripheral pulses? Blood pressure is not the value that I need right now. And quite frankly, I don't care what your blood pressure is. I care that you're not squirting. You have an intact airway. I don't need to put a needle in your chest. You're breathing adequately and you have a central and a peripheral pulse. And then the H. I'm going to stop and talk for a couple of extra minutes on hypothermia here because we need to own this. We really do. We do a really, really good job of making people trauma naked. And we pride ourselves, right? We get these, 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 you know, cutting tools. And by the way, the, the original EMS trauma shears, those don't work anymore. When they started mass producing, the original ones were actually worth a darn, but the newer ones, they just kind of flip sideways, you end up tearing their pants off anyway. So there are a lot of other things out there that you can really remove somebody's clothes quickly. So we get their clothes off, we find these injuries, we fix the injuries, and then we forget to cover the patient back up again. So now we have a trauma patient who is bleeding from a non-compressible source that could be in their chest, in their abdomen, their pelvis, their femurs, or any combination thereof. And we're just letting them shiver on our stretcher. That's going to cause a problem because when you get hypothermic, you get coagulopathic, which means your clotting cascade starts to collapse. So at that point, if I'm allowing you to stay cold, anything that I'm transfusing in you is essentially for naught. So I'm giving you a unit of whole blood, but you're cold. When your body temperature gets to around 92 degrees Fahrenheit, guess what? You're not clotting anymore. You're just not. We need to be do a better job of covering our patients back up again. And I don't mean us just in the pre-hospital setting. We see it in the trauma bay, at our trauma facilities. The patients are laying there and their bless their hearts are shivering and their body's telling you, keep me warm. I can't metabolize if I'm cold. I'm going to continue to bleed if I'm cold. So do your patient a favor, put a warm blanket on them, crank the heat up in the ambulance. If you're sweating like a hog, your patient's probably still a little bit too cold. So when you look at this video, this is not a human, by the way, nobody in their right mind would ever just take a video of a human bleeding and bleeding and bleeding. This is a poor sign. But when you see something like that, your instinct, the first thing you want to do is you want to put your finger on that artery and you want to push that artery up against a bone. Yes, you have permission to put your finger in a wound. You just have to give yourself permission to do that. Because if you let this hemorrhage continue and continue and continue as you're sitting there messing around with your tourniquet, guess what? Your patient's still bleeding to death. So by the time you put the tourniquet on them, they perhaps have lost so much blood that we may not be able to recover them from that, even with the units of whole blood that we carry in the field. So find the source of the bleed, put your finger on that artery and or vein, and we shouldn't distinguish or differentiate venous from arterial hemorrhage. It's all just massive hemorrhage. Be careful, however, because when you put your fingers in a wound, you could run your finger into a broken bone in, shrapnel, things like that. So I'm not suggesting we just with reckless abandon plug our finger into a wound. I would kind of test the water a little bit, but you're going to have to go proximal of that bleed and push it against something solid. Once you do that, sweep all the blood out of that channel. And if that channel is not filling back up with blood like Jed Clampett hit the oil well on the Beverly Hillbillies, then you've got control of the bleeding. Just stop and take what's called a combat breath. The patient's not bleeding to death. So now we can work with deliberate speed and we can deploy that tourniquet and put it on properly and stop the bleeding. So got to stop what's coming out before we even contemplate what's going in. The trauma triad of death is something that our military is very familiar with. It's something that we should all be familiar with. And it just shows you basically what I call the vortex of death. When a person gets hypothermic, hypothermia begets coagulopathy. Coagulopathy begets worsened tissue acidosis. And the colder you get, the more coagulopathic you get and the more acidotic you get. 
our sole function in life when taking care of a, a hemodynamically unstable patient, be it from a respiratory etiology, a circulatory etiology, or any combination thereof, is to prevent tissue acidosis. Once a patient gets acidotic, then their ability to compensate on their own essentially completely goes away. And now they're completely reliant upon us. So kind of look at it this way. The body will always do a better job of healing itself than anything that we can do to it. Because quite frankly, the human body was not created to be prepared to handle the crap that we're gonna do to it. So the human body does a much better job of taking care of itself. If we don't complement that by doing simple things like keeping the patient warm, tanking them up a little bit, creating a favorable condition so they can continue to compensate, then that patient is going to collapse in front of you every day of the week and twice on Sunday. So prevent tissue acidosis. And we can do that. It all starts simply by keeping your patient warm. All right, let's move into some transfusion criteria. So when do we pull that trigger, right? When do we pull the trigger? So some protocols may vary a little bit from locale to locale. I got these from uh, Mayo Clinic Kim's protocol, and these are essentially the same in our region. And we, we separate the patient as either being a, a trauma patient with a penetrating mechanism or one with a blunt mechanism. And as you can see up there in the upper left, if you have a penetrating mechanism and you're in shock, then you only need to meet one of these parameters, just one. But if you're blunt trauma, or if you have GI bleeding, a female with vaginal bleeding, then she would need to meet two of those physiologic criteria. So a single BP reading of less than 90 millimeters of mercury, single BP reading, uh, a single heart rate reading greater than 120. But most of the time in patients with ongoing hemorrhage, we don't just typically see a single reading. They have a persistent tachycardia. The shock index. Shock index is a unique um, a unique parameter. It's really, really easy to calculate. You just take your heart rate divided by your systolic blood pressure. And we're looking for a shock index that is less than one. You want a shock index that is less than one. Your shock index starts going up, which, which clearly means you're more hypotensive, you're more tachycardic, more systolically hypotensive, and you're more tachycardic then your shock index is gonna go up. And that's telling us, the provider, the degree of physiologic decompensation. So the higher your shock index, the more you're decompensating. But yet that's, that's, that is a hemodynamic parameter. And then we have your pulse pressure. Pulse pressure of less than 45, and that's simply your systolic BP minus your diastolic BP. For those of you that carry a point of care ultrasound, if your patient has a positive FAST exam, it's focused assessment to sonography and trauma, you're looking in Morrison's pouch, you're looking for areas of, of free blood in the peritoneum, for example, then that would be a transfusion criteria. Not a lot of agencies carry I-STATs in the field or have the ability to check a serum lactate, but lactate is simply a measure of tissue acidosis. If it were greater than five milligrams per deciliter, that would be another transfusion criteria. And the patient's age greater than or equal to five years of age. Now, Absolutely, you can transfuse a child in our region. That would be a, a, a quick phone call to our medical director. And we would typically probably give about 10 to 20 cc's per kilogram of blood in that uh, in little kiddo. So we can't forget a little miniature population out there. If they're losing blood, they need blood as well. This is uh, another example. This comes directly from the city of San Antonio, just to show you that, that there are some different uh, cr transfusion criteria and some different protocols. So they're taking any patient who's a trauma patient with signs of acute hemorrhagic shock in any systolic blood pressure of less than 70, regardless of heart rate. So you can have a normal heart rate because there are patients out there that take beta blockers and various other antihypertensives and may blunt that, that physiologic tachycardic response. So any single blood pressure reading of less than 70 or if their BP is less than 90 with a sustained heart rate greater than or equal to 110 or an entitled CO2 of less than 25. So I'm going to stop and talk about entitled CO2 for just a second and its utility in the decision scheme of transfusing whole blood. So imagine that you're a hemoglobin molecule, and on that hemoglobin molecule, there are four little pods called heme units, and each one of those will bind with one oxygen molecule. So a single hemoglobin molecule carries four oxygen molecules. And you oxygenate, you basically reload or load oxygen onto hemoglobin in your lungs then your blood, your uh, circulatory system transports all that oxygenated hemoglobin into the cellular level. You offload that oxygen at the cell, you mix in a little bit of glucose and voila, you're making ATP, you're making energy. The byproduct of that, that aerobic metabolism is carbon dioxide. 
then which that gets returned to the lungs and then you blow that off and we can monitor that with, uh, with our in tidal CO2. So imagine if you're losing blood, let's say that you don't have a respiratory problem. So you're, you're oxygenating in the lungs, you're loading oxygen onto hemoglobin in the lungs. However, as it's making its trek towards the cellular level, it's leaking out of the vascular space. So the end result is you don't get oxygen at the cellular level. And now your cell is gonna to revert to a, an anaerobic metabolism, right? And that does not make carbon dioxide, that makes lactic acid. So again, prevent acidosis. Well, if you're not getting oxygen to the cell and you're not making carbon dioxide, there's gonna be less carbon dioxide to return to the lungs to be picked up. That's why we use entitled CO2 is not just a measure of ventilation, it's the measure of perfusion. If your patient has a good capnographic waveform, then at least we know you are getting some perfusion at the cellular level, you're making carbon dioxide. Our bodies have to make carbon dioxide. If they don't, we simply cease to exist. So entitled CO2 is a very, a very important parameter for us to monitor. We can also use that, for example, in terms of septic shock or really any kind of shock because if my patient was, was physiologically deteriorating, I wouldn't expect their entitled CO2 to go up. I would expect their entitled CO2 to go down because they're just not getting the oxygen to the cell to make that CO2 to return to the body. So make sure that you're monitoring that pretty much in, in any trauma patient, any respiratory patient, any cardiac patient, any neuro patient, basically any patient who's talking to you, but has any kind of, or, or not talking to you, and has any kind of significant underlying pathology, critical parameter to measure. City of San Antonio is actually transfusing blood in witnessed traumatic arrests, provided that it was less than five minutes ago, and there was CPR continued throughout that entire downtime. That's not common across all systems that are using blood. And as you can imagine, there's probably some controversy out there of, okay, we have somebody that's in traumatic cardiac arrest. We know that at best the survival rates are very, very low, um, but they have actually had a couple of cases in the city of San Antonio. One in particular, um, it was a pregnant woman. She was standing at a bus stop and a, I don't know if the guy was driving drunk or whatever, veered and just creamed right through the bus stop and just took out a bunch of people. Had that woman not gotten blood and she was in cardiac arrest, had she not gotten blood in the field, she would have died. She walked out of the hospital alive. So it does work. We know it does work. Um, just, you know, you're gonna follow your local protocols in that regard. They also have some, uh, some considerations for elderly populations. So patients that are older than 65, their systolic blood pressure uh, need only be less than 100 and their heart rate need only be greater than 100 because, I mean, let's face it, the older we get, our physiologic reserves kind of decrease a little bit. So we may not get that robust tachycardia at 70 years of age that we did when we were 20, 25, or 30. So there is some, some variation there for our, for our older population. This is an example of our agency's protocols um, for transfusing blood. Now, I do wanna direct your attention to the very lower left of this protocol where it says Craig Manifold Dio. Uh, Dr. Manifold passed away unexpectedly on September 20th. It was a big blow to the EMS community. It was a big blow to our agency. Craig had been our medical director for 11 years. I met him in 1990 when I worked um, for the Air Force and it was just a crushing blow for our agency. So please keep his family in, in your thoughts and, and in your prayers. He, he was just a, a giant in the field of emergency medicine. So, but anyway, this is our blood administration protocol. So if you look at this, this middle example here, I'm, I'm hoping you can see my mouse cursor on the screen. These are our physiologic criteria. And as you can see, they're essentially the same as what you saw on the previous slides. We also use what's called compensatory reserve index or CRI. Now that requires a little monitoring device. It basically goes on your finger, just like a pulse ox probe. And it's essentially your body's fuel tanks, like your gas gauge. And the lower volume you get, then that's gonna reflect in your compensatory reserve index and it's gonna to start to drop. So if your CRI is less than 0.3, or we see a downward trend from, point, um, from 0.7 over five to 10 minutes, because anywhere between 0.7 and one would be a normal CRI. So we use that um, in our agency specifically, may not be an option for everybody. But, in, and again, we're in keeping with the one physiologic criteria is required if you have a penetrating mechanism or two physiologic criteria if you're blunt trauma, GI bleeding, or, um, or vaginal bleeding. There's really only one contraindication to giving anybody blood, and that's a religious objection. And that was ruled by the U.S. Supreme Court, which means you cannot do it. No 
ifs, ands, or buts about it. You can imagine um, we have to we have to allow people their their religious beliefs. We we have to be respectful of that. And if that patient is telling you, "Do not give me blood," then you cannot give them blood. You do. And it's just not going to go very well for you. So look at alternatives, discuss that with your patient. But at the end of the day, if they're telling you no, then we, we cannot give that to them, period. We also need to talk about calcium. And earlier that slide we looked at that showed the trauma triad, there's actually being proposed a, 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 um, a trauma diamond or the, the diamond of death. So it's your hypothermia, your coagulopathy, your acidosis, and then a fourth component being hypocalcemia. So we know that people who are bleeding become hypocalcemic. They drop their calcium level. If you, if you complement that, or in this case, um, compound that by giving somebody whole blood, which uh, contains this preservative, the CPD preservative, that's gonna make them more hypocalcemic. And hypocalcemia carries with it its own set of complications, the cardiovascular effects. You can get the prolongation of the QT interval, you get tingling in the extremities. You can see the, the chopstick sign here or the twitching of the facial uh, nerve. You tap, tip, tap over their facial nerve and uh, basically their facial muscles twitch. You put a blood pressure cuff on their arm, uh, keep it to a level above their systolic blood pressure for three minutes, and then they start developing a carpopetal spasm. These are all signs of hypocalcemia. So in our agency, in our region, we're giving a gram of calcium chloride or gluconate per one unit of transfused low titer O positive whole blood for that very reason. And let's face it, calcium is cheap, calcium is safe, calcium is a life-saving drug, especially in patients that are hyperkalemic. Um, it's, it's unfortunately, we miss a lot of cases of hyperkalemia and as a result of it, people just arrest right in front of us. But we also have to remember that calcium levels drop in patients who are bleeding to death. Transfusion reaction is a very generic term that could mean anything from just a local reaction to full-blown anaphylactic shock or a hemolytic reaction. So you can get, you know, by definition, if you have a body temperature increase of, of two degrees Fahrenheit above the normal baseline temperature, hives, itching, I mean, you can see the screen as easily as I can, flank pain, tachycardia, hypotension, blood in the urine. I mean, you can get a variety of, of different signs and symptoms, but we're gonna break those down just a little bit because we have to know what we could potentially induce in a patient when we are giving blood. As, as rare as these may be, it's still something we need to know about. A hemolytic reaction, essentially hemolysis, hemolysis in the blood occurs when the red blood cells that you give to somebody are destroyed by the recipient's immune system. And as a result of that, as you can imagine, that can lead to kidney injury, pulmonary problems, shock, and obviously eventually death. Um, there are non-immune reactions that can occur if the red blood cells are damaged before transfusion, which brings me right back to the storage and the transport. We have to have a very meticulous system of making sure that blood stays within a therapeutic temperature range and that we do not do anything to damage or in any way risk damaging or injuring that blood. So that way, when we do transfuse it, we minimize the, the risk of a non-immune reaction to our patient. Hemolytic reaction proper would happen if you gave somebody of one blood type, the completely different blood type. Um, that's typically we think of a hemolytic reaction. The incidence of this happening, as I said, with, with the, the blood that we're giving is about one in 80,000. And that's just of all transfusion reactions, not just your hemolytic reactions. Then you can have an allergic reaction, just a mild reaction, just a hypersensitivity to, to a foreign protein that's in the donor's blood. The patient may present with urticaria, maybe some cutaneous edema, or it could progress all the way to full-blown anaphylactic shock. And that's in a patient that has an inherent IgA deficiency, they're going to make antibodies against IgA, and then they receive blood products containing IgA. They already have these antibodies. Their immune system goes haywire, and they present with all the same signs and symptoms that you would expect to see in a patient with profound um, severe allergic reaction or anaphylactic shock. A couple of uh, a couple of reactions that uh, may occur, and and these are these are well documented, but again, very very uncommon. One is called transfusion associated circulatory overload or uh, taco, and that's when the volume of the transfused component simply causes a hypervolemic state, a hypervolemic state. Uh, I think what we I don't really know what I could do about that in the pre-hospital setting, to be honest with you, but the transfusion-related acute lung injury or trolley is when antibodies in the donor's blood 
uh, produce a, um, a leukocyte antigen or human neutrophil antigen that reacts with antigens in the recipient. And that can basically cause uh, almost like a flash pulmonary edema type of, uh, of scenario. Well, with that, we, we can use CPAP and, and other non-invasive forms of positive pressure ventilation to, uh, to treat that. So if your patient starts getting short of breath when you're transfusing blood, the first thing that I would consider is they're having an allergic reaction. But if they start showing evidence of pulmonary edema, they have the really, really nasty wet breast sounds, the rowels, the, the crackles, and in the worst case scenario, they start coughing up blood or hemoptysis, then that obviously would be a, a, a much uh, disturbing finding, something that we should probably take care of. So regardless of the transfusion reaction that you exp that you uh, your patient's experiencing, the treatment begins obviously with stopping uh, the, in the infusing agent, stop the offending agent. It would just be like you're stung by a bee and that the, the stinger of that bee is stuck in you and it's continuing to basically inject venom. The first thing you want to do is remove that offending agent. So you'd stop the transfusion immediately, change the IV tubing out, transition to IV fluids if the patient needs volume, and then obviously contact medical control um, make sure that the facility is aware of the reaction. So we're going to be providing the blood bag and the tubing to the receiving facility anyway, even if our transfusion has stopped. Um, by the time we get to the, uh, the, the receiving facility, we're going to give them the, the blood bag and the tubing because they're going to send it up to the blood bank and do what's called segment testing. And if you've ever seen, a, I'm sure you've seen a, a unit of whole blood, you have this little pigtail of, of coiled tubing at the end that's called the segment. And what they do is they take that up to the blood bank and they do segment testing on that um, just as a, um, as a secondary um, safety mechanism to make sure that that blood is, was truly safe to give to that patient. So <clears throat> regardless of whether or not the patient has a transfusion reaction or they don't, we're still gonna leave the blood bag and the, uh, the tubing uh, at the hospital. If they're having a mild allergic reaction, in other words, not an anaphylactic reaction, maybe they have some hives, some itching, then simply just some, some diphenhydramine, some Benadryl. Um, uh, maybe all that's needed to be able to take care of that. Obviously, if they're in anaphylactic shock, then we're going to treat them anaphylactically. We're going to give epinephrine. Initially, you could give your 0.3 to 0.5 milligrams IM, get IV access and, and give it IV, and maybe give some other vasopressors for um, really severe protracted anaphylaxis, maybe even norepinephrine. If it's a, you know, a fever type of uh, pyre a pyrotic type of reaction, um, and we just simply give them some Tylenol. Uh, we do carry IV Tylenol, excuse me. <coughs> we carry IV Tylenol, it's called Offermev. Um, we also carry um, oral Tylenol. So that would pretty much be your treatment for a pyrogenic reaction. Stop the transfusion and then get an antipyretic on board. If there's any evidence of pulmonary edema or that uh, transfusion related acute lung injury, then CPAP, just like you would treat any other patient with uh, pulmonary edema because now that patient has an oxygenation and a ventilation problem. So we need to help clear, maintain that end expiratory pressure on the alveoli to keep oxygenation and respiration going. The patient's really, really hypotensive. We may need to give them some IV fluid boluses of crystalloid, and maybe, like I said earlier, some vasopressors, an epinephrine infusion, maybe even a norepinephrine infusion. Calcium chloride or gluconate, if there's evidence of hypocalcemia, again, and then again, this is just our this is just our agency. We give calcium as a matter of routine after we give blood, simply because we know that bleeding people, uh, bleeding patients will drop their calcium, and the uh, the CP preserved it can can actually um, kind of exacerbate that. Calcium and sodium bicarb, if there's evidence of hyperkalemia, and and more emphasis on the calcium than the bicarb. Calcium is the life saving drug for hyperkalemia and calcium is a lysine drug for hypocalcemia. Sodium bicarb is designed to start that shift of potassium back into the intracellular environment. But the, the critical treatment, the most important treatment we can get for these folks is get that calcium on board. And that could be anywhere between one and two grams, depending on your age and protocols. All right, so we're, we're kind of getting to the, to the end here, but I want to share with you our experience. I want to share with you our regional experience. And every, every patch and badge that you see up our... Uh, up on here is is the represents our our whole blood consortium and and it starts with the South Texas Blood and Tissue Center. We have to have obviously a way of getting the blood, 
Uh, but it could be your hospital blood bank. It doesn't have to be, um, you know, the Red Cross or your blood and tissue center. This could be an arrangement you make with a hospital blood bank to rotate blood in and out of the pre-hospital setting. We just happen to use the South Texas Blood and Tissue Center. South Texas Regional Advisory Council, that's our, our overseeing entity for our 22 counties and our, our trauma service area. So it was between STRAC and the South Texas Blue Center. And there are a lot of really smart people at STRAC, a lot of former military people at STRAC who started asking the question, can we do this in our area? Can we transfuse blood in the pre-hospital setting? And, and drawing upon all the years and years and years of military experience and all the research and the evidence, the answer was absolutely we can. So the, the program in our area got fired up in early 2018. We also work strong uh, directly with UT Health. UT Health uh, provides medical direction and oversight for the city of San Antonio University Health System, which is our um, one of our two level one trauma centers in the uh, city of San Antonio. And all these EMS agencies that you see up here um, basically came together. And there are more that are being added. I think we have maybe five or six that are in the queue. They're getting ready to be put up uh, as a as a rotation as a rotation site. So Brothers in Arms, I mentioned that earlier, that is a, that's a private club, right? It's a members only club of folks that have been identified because they have been past donors as being one, they're O positive and two, they're low titer O positive. And they have a pretty impressive pool of donors with a, uh, a, a um, rate of showing up. If they schedule an appointment to donate blood, about 75 to 76% of the time they show up. So that's really, really good. So a lot of people out there, there are a lot of good people who realize that, hey, this blood is needed. This blood can allow us to save more lives and even type O negative. So Brothers in Arms is crucial. It's, it's the bedrock, quite frankly, of our blood program. And then none of this would be possible. This is what our regional whole blood program looks like. So as an EMS agency, if you look to the left, where it says uh, zero day blood and then 14 day blood with the arrow pointing back to the right. We as an EMS agency or an air medical provider or a level four trauma center, which is also referred to as a critical access hospital, we get blood directly from the donor. So when a person comes in and they donate blood, the, the blood is obviously typed and it's screened um, for obviously anything that could, that could literally you know, cause further harm to a patient. And then we get the blood immediately from the donor. We keep that blood for 14 days. If we don't use that blood within 14 days, then it goes back to South Texas Blood and Tissue Center. And from day 15 through its, through its, through its life of 35 days, it goes back to a rotation center. So the, the air medical provider, the level four trauma facility is simply a rotation site. And as I said earlier, because we're a rotation site, we are transporting the blood for a period of two weeks. We don't use it, it goes back to the rotation center. And our waste rate in our, our region is, is really, really small waste in terms of because the blood is expiring. What about cost? Well, we have to address that. So there is obviously an initial cost to start up. You have to get the, the tick panels, you have to get the mechanism to store the blood. Um, you have to buy the first unit of blood, at least in It may not be the same with every area. We, we do buy the first, you get put into a rotation system. So if we don't transfuse that blood in the 14 days that we carry it, then we simply swap it out for a new unit that we bring goes back. We get another year of blood, South Texas Blood and Tissues us a credit. So the, we, don't, we don't pay for the blood if we don't transfuse it. Now, if we do transfuse it, then we have to buy another unit of blood. Or if we do something on our end that makes that blood not usable, if we let it get too warm, if we let it get too cold, we do anything that injures the blood and makes it non-transfusable, then, uh, then we'd have to buy another unit of blood. So really, once you get into the rotation of things um, and you've got the upfront costs out of the way of the blood storage and the cooling and the temperature monitoring, really, I mean, it's just a matter of buying another unit of blood uh, when you transfuse it. Uh, we right now cannot bill for blood. Um, and then I'm, I don't do billing stuff, but I know that in our area, we can't bill for it right now. I know the aid, the uh, organization that does our EMS billing is working on that right now. Um, so in the future, we'll be able to recoup the cost of buying that new unit of blood, um, probably by putting it as a line. I'm, I'm not even going to pretend like I know EMS billing, but I know right now that we, we can't bill for it. But for us, it's still, I mean, it's $418 for a unit of blood. 
and we consider that to be a small price to pay. Um, we've done nine transfusions in our agency since we came online. We've been online since July of 2019, and we're not an extremely high volume system, but we get duty calls. And we've unfortunately had several missed opportunities where the patients met the criteria for transfusion, but uh, the, the bat battalion chief may have been, you know, out of pocket for some reason, maybe working a structure fire or something, or the crew just didn't recognize, hey, this patient could benefit from it. So in all reality, we probably should have transfused about 20 patients up to this point, but we've had nine solid transfusions, all fortunately I can uh, uh, report with good outcomes. So anyway, that's the way the, the whole rotation system works. This is our trauma service area, and you can see where the little ambulances are and the hospitals and the, the air medical. These are all the agencies that are currently carrying blood, and this is as of July 1st. And if you look at Bear County, you can see there's a lot in Bear County because Bear County encompasses not just the city of San Antonio, it encompasses multiple little locales, as, as many large cities. So we have uh, Bear County District 7, Bear County District 2, um, we have the city of San Antonio, we have Acadian Ambulance that provides 911 system to the county. The city of San Antonio provides service only within the city limits. And then when you get outside Bear County, up in Comal County, right in here, this would be where I live. Well, actually I live in Bernie right here, but this would be where I work. So this is our little ambulance right here. And then Canyon Lake, just to, uh, to our, uh, our East carries blood, New Braunfels Fire Department, all three of those agencies are within Comal County. So our agency services the western part of Comal County, Canyon Lake services the center part, and New Braunfels services the eastern part, and all three of our agencies carries one unit of low tide or positive whole blood. And we're, we're looking to eventually get to a point where we carry more than one unit. But you can see it's very prolific around our area, and, uh, and that those agencies are just growing and growing and growing by the day. These are these are data that I pulled from uh, from uh, from our STRAC, the uh, the head researcher. Her name is Randy Schaefer, and I can get your contact information. Randy is just a brilliant woman. She's a retired Air Force nurse, and she's just been in, in all kinds of places and done all kinds of things. And she was really critical and instrumental in getting this whole thing up and running. But she was gracious enough to provide me with these data here. So we've done 673 transfusions region-wide, that's within our 22 county area since January of 2018. As you can see most of those are by ground EMS, 81 by HIMSS, and then four by our critical access hospitals. Those would be our level four trauma facilities. No major reactions in terms of transfusion reactions, none that were linked to pre-hospital transfusion, and our waste due to expiration is less than 2%, which is absolutely fabulous, which means if the blood doesn't get used in the pre-hospital setting, it's going to be used in a level one trauma center. It's going to be used at that rotation center. So this is a really important marketing point when you're trying to get something like this up, um, when you look at wastage rate, because you don't want to put blood out there and assign it to an agency that maybe runs, I don't know, 1, 1,000, 1,100 calls a year, and they don't transfuse that blood. So basically, it's just sitting there for 35 days. So that's why when we keep it for 14, we put it somewhere where it's ultimately gonna be used. But in the big scheme of things, less than 2% uh, wastage in our area because of, uh, because of expiration. Here are some resources here. Uh, this is our, our STRAC website slash blood. Um, you can go to that website and you can see everything about our whole blood program. You can read protocols, you can pull science. It's just a cornucopia of really, really good information. Then the Thor Network, um, it actually provides a really, it's free. And that's, a, I, I like everything that's free, right? The Thor Network, you can go to this website right here and you can take a free online course in pre-hospital transfusion. And you'll hear about people far smarter than me. You'll hear a lot of, a lot of research and, and just the countless benefits, the, the innumerable benefit of giving patients whole blood in the field and you get continuing education for doing it. So between those two websites, it's my hope that, that you'll be armed with some information to be able to go back to your agency heads and say, hey, maybe this is something we should consider doing in our area. But one thing that you have to look at is you have to look at some history. You have to go back and, and ask yourself how many patients could have benefited from blood. And it's really not until you do that that you really appreciate how much you, how, or appreciate what you have when you do get the blood. 
because I could, you know, before we started carrying whole blood, I could think of 20 patients just at the top of my head that could have benefited or should have benefited from whole blood, but we just didn't have it to provide to them. And unfortunately, um, a lot of those, as you can imagine, do not have good outcomes. So anyway, this is my, my, my presentation. At this point, if there are any questions, just hit me up in the chat box. I'm here right here uh, watching this presentation with you guys. Here's my contact information right here. Please, if you have any questions, please send me an email. I don't do a lot on Facebook. I do a lot on Twitter. So hit me up on Twitter. I'll provide you with all the resources that I have. I'll answer any questions that you may have uh, to help you, your agency, your region, um, get this precious commodity out in the field so we can start saving more lives than we already are. Folks, thank you so much for your attention. I really hope you enjoy the rest of the conference and be safe.